trees are getting attention right now for good reasons. Um, trees do all sorts of awesome things. They can cool our cities, they help keep air clean, they capture stormwater, and they look great and improve property values. There's also increased attention to climate change and how trees, particularly trees in urban environments, can help us uh, solve or mitigate against climate change. Um, there's this neat organization, City Forest Credits, it's starting to actually look at how we might be able to create and sell carbon credits for urban forestry. Regardless of all of this attention, we're still losing tree canopy. So this is actually data that the US Forest Service put out a number of years ago, and it, and it shows um, annual percent decline in urban forests in different states across the country. The only ones that weren't really losing trees were South Dakota and Wyoming, which arguably didn't have many trees to begin with. And so the urbanization of those states where people are planting trees in their backyard may be leading to increased canopy. But for the rest of us, we're all losing trees. If we look at Michigan here, which is one of the statistically significant states, you know, we're losing roughly um, you know, 0.09 to 0%. For Michigan, I think it's actually 0.09. Uh, oh, actually, it's higher. So at Michigan, it's the 0.24 to 0.1% each year we're losing trees. And in Michigan, I think it's actually 0.13. So over 10 years, we're losing 1.3% tree canopy in our urban environments, despite a whole lot of work that's being done in urban forestry. So why is that happening? You know, I, I like to think about uh, the work that we do as urban foresters, as community advocates for our trees is setting direction. We're, we're helping our communities understand where they can put effort and resources to improve the trees in our community. And so arguably we may be following the wrong directions. We may be following the GPS into the lake instead of stepping back and thinking like, what should we maybe be doing? What tools do we need to consider more carefully what our strategy should be to improve the urban forest in our community. So today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about the different tools that are available to us as resource managers to help us figure out where and how we should be putting our resources in the improvement of urban trees in our community. In our world, in urban forestry, you often have sort of a little bit of a push and pull between private tree maintenance and public tree management. The public tree management is the piece that a lot of people in this room are probably familiar with. That's managing the trees along community streets. It's um, maintaining the trees in city parks. It's planting trees in those spaces. It's pruning the trees in those spaces. It's removing the trees in those spaces. However, in our urban communities, the majority of the trees in those communities are in private property. Those are the trees in my backyard, the trees in your backyard, the trees in your front yard that do not fall under a municipal jurisdiction. And arguably those trees are providing significantly more benefits to the public than the trees along the street. A tree doesn't really care if it's in my front yard or on the street, it's still gonna provide shade to the community, it still provides clean air, it still captures stormwater. And so those trees are just as important as the ones along the street. And so for me, the, when we talk about an urban forest and we talk about community forestry, that's really at the intersection between this public tree management and the private tree maintenance. And so the tools we're gonna to talk about today, some of them are centered a little bit more on public tree management, which we'll talk about first, but then we're gonna talk about tools that help with the entire urban forest, not only private trees, but look at the entire urban forest across the community, both public and private. We're not gonna talk at all today about tools that are specific to private tree maintenance. So uh, I'm gonna to start today talking about public tree management and some of the tools that are available to help us improve or, or make more efficient our work on public trees. And then I am going to uh, strive to have a one to two minute break um, so that you can get another cup of coffee and not fall asleep in the middle of me talking. Although I can't see you, so that's perfectly fine if you need a nap. Um, but then we'll talk about the more, uh, you know, holistic urban forest management tools. So this is what uh, we want our community streets to look like, or I hope we all want our community streets to look like big mature trees, inviting spaces for people to walk. Um, this is an excellent uh, picture of, of what that might be. Unfortunately, we can't all achieve this, but it's certainly a, a wonderful goal. However, trees also sometimes look like this. 
And, and it's important as um, evangelists of trees and urban forestry to understand that it's not just the benefits that everyone else thinks about with the trees. It's also the possibility of the risks. And this, this is something that in, in the world of a public tree manager is always present in the mind. We need to balance the benefits of trees, the wonderful things trees do for us against the potential risk that they might provide should they fail uh, catastrophically when, when we don't want them to. So one of the great tools to help with that is actually a tree risk management policy or a tree risk management plan. So this is actually some images of a plan that uh, I worked on several years ago with the city of Novi. And it, it did use some of their tree inventory data, but these do not need to be done. You do not have to have a tree inventory to do a tree risk management or policy. Rather, the meat of this particular plan was to identify where the major thoroughfares are and business districts and emergency routes. And those are in red on the left of the screen. So these are the streets that have high volume of traffic. They're the streets that are critically important to you know, keeping the city moving. They're the streets that have uh, immense importance to the local emergency um, services. And those are the streets that if, if we think about risk, you have the highest potential for risk should a tree fail. And so these are the streets where the city should be putting its highest level of attention. This is important. This is important because arguably this is not where most cities receive a lot of their requests for service. A lot of the requests for service are often in all those gray streets, the neighborhoods where people are, are living, where people are interacting with their trees more regularly, not driving by at 50 miles an hour. And so these risk management policies can help reorient the community practices around urban forestry to where there's the highest level of risk opposed to where there's the highest level of request for service. In Novi, we did have tree inventory data. So we were also able to layer this with uh, information about size of trees, condition of trees, um, species of trees, because certain species have higher incidences of failure due to their, their um, just their nature of growth. And, and that's all helpful too. So what we can do then is based on understa an understanding of where these major thoroughfares are, where these business districts are, where these emergency routes are, start to put together some timing of inspections. And so this is what that looked like in Novi. And this is all based on the resources you have. This is kind of flexible. Um, but we suggested that you know, in, in these uh, very high priority areas, these, these red streets, or actually, if I go back, more of the red areas on the map on the right, um, those should be reviewed a level one inspection. So drive-by inspection of trees should be done every year. In the areas that are more these, um, these orangish colors, we suggested uh, you know, these, these level ones should be two to four years uh, and so on. So it's just establishing an expectation around an inspection interval and that you are gonna prioritize your inspections in the areas that have the highest likelihood for risk, uh, for elevated risk. And then by nature, that's also where you're gonna be spending most of your attention on the tree work as you probably should. So at the end of the day, like maps are great, but you need to put it into a policy or some sort of plan. And it doesn't need to be you know, some big 50 page document, but you need to articulate that based on the prioritization that you identified in your risk management approach, um, how you're gonna go about that. So the, the first like basic first step is to identify the priority inspection zones, which I just showed you, and then determine how frequently and what type of inspection you're gonna do in each zone. And then you need to actually make that happen. So you need to identify a person and a deadline to get that done. Throughout that process, you're going to identify some tree concerns. And so you need to articulate in your policy how quickly those concerns are going to be addressed. So if you identify a tree risk concern that's high, is that gonna be done in 30 days, in two weeks, in six months? What resources do you have? What's reasonable for your community? If it's a moderate risk, is that something you're even gonna worry about? Maybe your community has accepted that moderate risk is appropriate with trees. Um, I'm using a little bit of lingo for tree risk assessments. If you're not familiar with that, um, you know, tree risk assessment qualification through the International Society of Boriculture is familiar to you, but it's not really important necessarily for this. What I'm trying to communicate is that this policy or this plan is a way to articulate 
how your community looks at its trees, how regularly it looks at its trees, and then what it does once it finds issues. Um, why this is important is because if you have a written, uh, a, a well-written tree risk policy that your community or your institution can fall back on, that's going to guide how your work happens. And what I mean by that is whether you, your work is dictated by the random inquiries that come into your community or whether you can start getting proactive and um, start looking more towards the future of how to manage your program. The other thing that matters is if there is a, uh, a tree failure that causes damage or injury and you have a tree risk management policy and you followed your policy, you're going to be more protected. I can't say that you're gonna be fully protected, but you're gonna be more protected. You actually can use this policy to say, we've given this consideration. Let me back up for a minute. No one has unlimited resources, right? I wish I did. I don't have unlimited resources. I don't have unlimited dollars. I don't have unlimited time. And so at some point you have to prioritize the resources you have in order to get the job done. And everyone recognizes that, like we all get that. This policy, communicates how you're prioritizing those limited resources. So if you have a policy and you recognize you have a limited resource and you follow your policy, that's communicating to the world that you're doing what you can to manage risk, that you are judiciously exercising a level of care and that's important. So these aren't very common, they should be far more common and they're a great tool to help communicate how your community manages trees, how your community addresses risk, and helps um, provide a level of understanding both to the public and to the people that work in your community what you're trying to accomplish. Next, I want to talk about a tree inventory. This is uh, actually where I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's East Hills. It's a neighborhood. It's one of the um, neighborhoods that really uh, created a resurgence of urban forestry in Grand Rapids. A lot of concerned neighbors um, who love trees and were willing to get their uh, hands dirty in urban forestry live. I happen to live, I don't know if my cursor shows up, but sort of the bottom middle of, of the map here. Um, and that's right where I'm staring at the, uh, the tree pruning going on right now. But a, a tree inventory can be a very useful tool to help you understand the composition and status of all of the trees of an area of interest. That area of interest could be a property, it could be a park, it could be a campus, or it could be all the street trees, or it could be the street trees only in a downtown area. Um, a tree inventory can either be done for the entire area of interest, or you can do a sample inventory, a random sample for a portion of your area of interest that then you can use to extrapolate information about the entire area of interest. I'm going to make an important distinction real quick before the rest of this conversation about tree inventories is about entire inventories. But if you do a sample inventory, it can give you information about the population of your trees, but it is not information you can use to determine which trees need work. You need an entire inventory in order to operationalize the data and make decisions about tree work. So we're gonna talk about entire inventories. So at a minimum, a tree inventory should give you the tree's site or location, the species of that tree, the size or the diameter of that tree, um, usually with tree size, we're talking diameter at four and a half feet above the ground. Um, not frequently are we talking about height. So size or diameter is diameter at four and a half feet above the ground, which is a standard uh, location to measure trees. What maintenance might be needed is important. So does, uh, if you come across a tree, does it need pruning? Does it need removal? Do you need to raise the tree to uh, ensure traffic and pedestrians can get under it? Priority or risk, this is important. If you collect a bunch of tree inventory data and you don't assess some sort of prioritization or uh, use the International Society of Arboriculture's risk levels to, do, to, to prioritize, then you're gonna be left with a bunch of data and have no idea where to start. So you, you need to come up with some sort of system and there's several out there to figure out how to assess priority or risk level as you're doing the inventory. And then another thing that's often left out that's really important is utilities. Are there utilities present? And it depends on your community and your capabilities. Some, um, some inventories include all utilities, communication line, phone line, and power lines, uh, and service drops. So you'll have utilities almost everywhere. 
Other um, inventories are primarily interested in more the distribution lines and primary electrical lines. And either of those are okay. Your data is meant to work for you. So you just need to make sure that the right data are being collected that is meaningful to you. How do you collect the data? Well, someone's got to walk the streets. There are various ways of using um, remote sensing and uh, like Google Street Views to do some of this. But when you're talking about having to assess tree maintenance and priority, you really need to walk around the tree. And so this is still done for the time being with someone walking along the street. They usually have some sort of uh, electronic computer and they're typing in information as they go and putting dots on a map or using GPS. One, uh, you can do this pen and paper with uh, you know, sort of a printout data sheet that you write as you go. Um, I've certainly done that before and then you go back and type it in at home, that's fine. But one thing, one tip I wanna give everyone if you decide to go do a tree inventory on your own is to print out a map of community streets and highlight them as you finish them. Otherwise you're liable to miss a street. You know, I, that happens all the time. But if you have this map and you highlight as you finish streets, you'll find that uh, that happens a whole lot less frequently. Tree inventory data is incredibly robust. There's all sorts of cool things you can do with it. This is uh, by neighborhood where the size of the dot is the size of the tree and the color is condition. So um, you can see here that uh, there are a lot of aging trees that are in um, you know, fair to poor condition. Uh, you know, there's a lot of small trees that are in good condition, which is sort of what you wanna see. And there's lots of trees of various sizes all over the community, except for the center of the community, which is the business district. Uh, and this is a really neat way to sort of look at data and information. We can also actually um, keep the size of the dot, the size of the tree, and start to look at what type of work needs to happen. And there's tons of different ways that you can look at these data, think about these data, and then most importantly, use these data to prioritize where you need to do work first. Whenever a community um, finishes a tree inventory and I'm working with them, we always assess risk. And the risk levels are extreme, high, moderate, or low. And I, I tell a community that for any extreme trees, it's not even ending up in your inventory. You're getting a phone call from our technician and that tree needs to be handled immediately. So those don't show up. For high trees, I say those are ones that we need to talk about um, taking care of as soon as reasonable. And that means different things for different communities depending on their resources. For moderate trees, I tend to coach that those are trees that should be handled with routine maintenance. So let's talk a little bit about a, um, a cyclical program of getting through your community streets and you handle those. There's no such thing as ri no risk. And so low risk is the lowest you can get. And I, tell, I tend to tell communities that I work with, it, don't bother working with low risk trees because you're not gonna get the risk any lower. Um, there's no benefit from doing that. And so those are ones where uh, you, you can ignore them until the, the risk situation changes. So that's a tree inventory. A tree inventory is an incredibly useful tool to get a, um, a, a census, if you will, of your community's trees, uh, institutions trees, to understand what the extent and the condition is, and then use that data, those data, to make improvements to your community forest. Sometimes inventories also include stumps and planting sites, which can also be used to plant trees or grind stumps. Um, sometimes inventories also include an assessment of sidewalk lift and associated with trees. There's all sorts of data that can be collected, but I think it's important to understand that the minimum here is what is really useful to managing trees. So I wanna talk now about a tree management plan. Once you have an inventory uh, or even a sample inventory that gives you some data about um, the extent of your trees in your community, you can create a tree management plan. A tree management plan is something that largely is dedicated to the management of trees under your control. So this could be trees on a college campus if you're a campus arborist, this could be trees along city streets or trees within parks, but they're trees under your control because this is an operational plan. This is gonna tell you, it's gonna have a resource assessment about your plan, uh, about your trees, and then it's gonna give you things you can do to help meet your objectives. So generally, a, a management plan is going to include an executive summary. Uh, any good um, document assessment study has an executive summary that just you know, pulls out the highlights of the entire document. It'll have an introduction, talking a little bit about um, your community or your institution, uh, you know, what issues it faces, what's been going on around urban forestry, 
the introduction should also include your goals. So what are you trying to accomplish in your program, uh, particularly as it relates to the management of the, the tree resources that you have responsibility for? Then the plan should start with an assessment of the current resource. So what is the current situation of the trees in your community or institution? What's the species distribution? What's the diameter distribution? How is the condition of those trees? What kind of maintenance needs are there? You know, what did the inventory tell us about that? What kind of resources do you have? What are your current operations? All of that. It's not necessary, but it's also helpful then to have a, a section that talks about the benefits of trees. Once you have a tree inventory, you can actually um, have the ecosystem benefits assessed, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And, and that can be a, a helpful way to communicate why the resource is important. And then the final section should be a plan of action. What types of things need to happen and what resources are required to make them happen and on what timeline to get the job done. So what do you need to do with your tree resources to help you accomplish your goals? Um, so at a minimum, you know, there should be the goals and objectives. There should be an analysis of resource, like species distribution, size and age, maintenance needs, and then a management program that addresses uh, the primary activities that you're responsible for, removal, pruning, planting, and risk management. Although various communities or institutions may have other interests, such as urban wood utilization or public involvement in volunteerism or, um, you know, addressing some of their policies. And those are okay. But at a minimum, these are the things that are needed in there. On the right hand, you can kind of see what might be um, in an executive summary that summarizes the various work that needs to happen in a basic management plan and some of the resources that might be required to, uh, to move those things forward. Um, this one in particular is sort of an aggressive uh, management plan that includes not only the work that was identified as high or extreme risk, but also um, putting a community into a, a routine pruning cycle uh, where they're going to be doing a five-year cycle. So, you know, the budget here is relatively high compared to what a lot of communities might be able to implement. So I'm, I'm just going to show a, a couple of like analyses that might be included in a management plan. This is for Petoskey. It's one that we recently did. And so I thought I would show that. Um, and there is a, a common uh, guideline that's used in our industry that says no more than 30% of any uh, population of trees should be one family of tree species, no more than 20% um, any one genus, and no more than 10% of any one species. So we can see here in Petoskey, there's uh, a leaning towards maple, which is true of, I think, most Michigan communities. We need to plant less maple if we want a diverse urban forest that's resilient to pest and disease and climate change. Here's uh, just a snapshot of what ecosystem benefits might look like in, in Petoskey. And these are only for the right-of-way trees because an inventory and a management plan is focused on the trees under the direct control of the city. <clears throat> you know, trees have a lot of value and it's displayed in the way that they contribute to property value, to energy benefits, water benefits, greenhouse gas. And then here's just a, a neat graphic that, you know, talks a little bit about the prioritization of city work. So first in this management plan, it says, we need to take care of the high priority issues. And so that's the removals and pruning then we can begin to think a little bit about moderate priority. Um, I, I honestly, this graph, like I'd love to see it. I didn't personally write this plan and I would have taken that low priority and put it way down at the bottom. Um, but you know, the high priority for sure. And then you can think about moderate and I might've put that down with the young tree training and routine inspection, but that's, that doesn't, it's a moot point. Like the point is you need to, to set a plan of action in your management plan that tells you what you're gonna do on what order and uh, with what resources. And you may not get all this done. You may not have the time or the finances to get it all done, but you can at least use this plan to communicate to community leaderships, to you know, your um, supervisors, what you think needs to be done, what resources you need. And it's a great tool to ask for the money, ask for the personnel you might need to make it happen. Uh, I like having budget sheets in these management plans that really lay it out by year, what activities are gonna do, what the cost is. This is what something like that might look like. Um, you know, this one accounts for, you know, taking care of the high risk pruning. Uh, it has money for routine inspection, 
And we can also look at the very bottom, natural mortality is figured in, and then having to pay for the removal of the trees that naturally die, and then also tree planting and, and replacement. So uh, management plans, again, are a tool to take the information you have about your community trees, um, really give some consideration to the goals you have for your resource, and then to create a plan of action about what you're gonna do to accomplish your goals. It's a communication tool. It's a way that you can let your supervisor, your community or institution leadership know how you plan to get your job done and better what resources you need to make it happen so that they can help either get you those resources or help you, un or I mean, help you and you help them understand what's not gonna happen. And that's fine too, but it's a, it's a great document. They're usually about five, they usually have about five year timelines, sometimes 10. Um, but I think in urban forestry, it's a little tough to predict what's going to happen in years eight and nine and 10. And so I tend to like five year timelines for these types of plans. So another public tree management tool is a tree ordinance. And I'm going to make a distinction right now between a tree preservation ordinance and a tree ordinance. And a lot of people tend to just say tree ordinance and they mean everything. Um, and a tree ordinance may handle both public and private trees. But when I'm gonna talk about tree ordinance right now, I want to specifically talk about the, uh, the, the ordinances that affect public trees. So a, a tree ordinance um, is generally a document that uh, says who has the authority to manage or maintain community trees, who has a responsibility to manage or maintain community trees, how people who don't have that authority can get permission to do that, what is allowed to happen to community trees, and so on. This is a just a snapshot of the Grand Rapids Tree Ordinance, and it has, I think, some of the standard sections you might see, just um, you know, a, a purpose and intent that's in a general section, some rules and regulations, so what you can and can't do, or in this case, um, the rules and regulations in Grand Rapids Tree Ordinances is, is specifically establishing a separate manual of rules and regulations that's approved by the city regularly. It establishes an urban forestry committee or tree committee, um, and then it talks a little bit about protection, planting, and pruning and felling. So what needs to happen around public trees and who can do it. Uh, there is a section of utility vegetation management and then public nuisances. So like, you know, you, you can't set a fire under a city tree. You can't just go nailing poster into city trees. Uh, and then appeal procedures, landmark trees, and so on. So this ordinance is specifically related to what can happen to city trees and doesn't have anything to do with what happens with private trees. There are great guides out there and uh, information to help create ordinances. Um, it's a little bit outdated now, but the International Society of Arboriculture put out in 2001 guidelines for developing and evaluating tree ordinances. A lot of the information in there is still valid um, and it's, uh, it's available regularly online, but a little bit hard to find directly through the ISA website. And then on the right hand, the Arbor Day Foundation has a sample tree ordinance. This is a very um, simplified ordinance. It's to help communities who need an ordinance to become a Tree City USA, which is a requirement. So it, it basically just meets their minimum uh, required standards. I, I'm not sure I would coach a community to use this directly, unless for the time being, all they're trying to do is meet the Tree City USA standards. I think there's, um, you know, a, an ordinance deserves a little bit more consideration than is accounted for in, in that tool. So at a minimum, your ordinance should have a robust purpose and intent. Uh, this is important. I see a lot of like lackluster purpose and intent. Like the purpose is to protect uh, community trees from undue harm. The problem with that is if your ordinance is ever challenged, what's gonna be challenged is whether the policies that are in your ordinance are of the appropriate magnitude to accomplish the purpose of that ordinance. So if you have a very light purpose and then you have a lot of restrictions in your ordinance and that gets challenged, you're gonna have a hard time explaining why all of those restrictions are gonna help you accomplish a very small purpose. If your purpose and intent, however, accounts for trees as a valuable public resource that help with the management of community stormwater and help ensure the air quality in your community and are critical assets to human health and so on and so forth, you can make a stronger case that you can have more restrictions around how your trees are handled. So the purpose and intent is actually very important and oft overlooked. 
you, your minimum should, I mean, your ordinance should include uh, authority. Who, who has the authority to manage and maintain public trees? It should have prohibited acts and public nuisances. So like what should, what cannot people do to trees? They probably shouldn't be storing materials for any length of time under the trees. They probably shouldn't be severing roots without the permission of the city. They probably shouldn't be pruning or removing or otherwise maintaining, injuring or harming city trees without permit. Like those are the types of things that should be in that section. And then permitting, sure. People are, are going to need every now and then to harm, injure, maintain a city tree without the city actually doing the work themselves. And so you need to have some sort of uh, relief valve to allow that to happen. And um, you know, permitting, the tree permit is usually where that happens. And then lastly, um, you, you do need to account for some sort of appeal or enforcement. In some communities, this is uh, its own chapter in the whole city code, and it doesn't need to be addressed separately in the ordinance. But it's, it's usually also good to think a little bit about if there's a dispute about a tree permit, who's gonna handle that? Is that gonna go right to the city council? Is that something that maybe goes to a tree board or, or how is that being handled? The process of developing an ordinance um, is to, this is really important. I've been involved in a number of ordinance development processes and I've also seen a lot of them play out fairly poorly. And the ones that play out poorly is when an ordinance, even only an ordinance that affects public trees is done in the vacuum by community staff without um, any sort of stakeholder involvement. Now the stakeholder group doesn't necessarily need to be some big public engagement process. In some cases that may be necessary, but that's not what it always has to be. At a minimum though, you should think about involving other um, city staff, other community staff in the development of an ordinance who might be impacted by some of your provisions. And so it, it may not just be forestry or public works, but also planning, code enforcement, um, engineering, like they all in some way interact with city trees around the infrastructure that they maintain. And so there, there needs to be some conversations around uh, how trees are managed in your community, who manages them and who has the right to and how that's going to happen moving forward. And so you need to have those conversations. So um, either way, stakeholder involvement is important. But the process is you define the problem. Too often I've been told we're reviewing our ordinance and I ask, why are you reviewing your ordinance? Well, we think it's old and it needs to be updated. I'm like, well, okay, um, that's kind of easy, but what, like usually there's something that caused you to think it's old and it needs updating and what was that? Usually there's some sort of community issue or annoyance or you know another, city departments having trouble with the ordinance, or maybe they're not following the ordinance, or maybe trees are being removed when they shouldn't have if the city forester was involved. So usually there's some sort of problem. So we need to figure out what that is first, because otherwise there's, there's no point opening the ordinance and looking at it if we can't identify what we're trying to improve through that process to begin with. Then I always coach people to review the authority, like who has the authority to manage the trees, the purpose and intent first, and make sure that stuff gets cleaned up. Um, because sometimes the problems can be alleviated right in those sections. But beyond that, you need to research the factors that are driving the problem that you identified. Determine what your desired outcomes are in the future. What are you trying to make better and what would it look like? And then you specifically craft provisions that address those factors that are driving the problem and achieve your outcomes. There's no such thing as just like making a perfect ordinance. There's such a thing as making a perfect ordinance that solves a problem or two. And too often, this is totally forgotten. Once you're all done, the ordinance is passed. It's, it's gone through your, your city council, or your city commission, and it's in force. You, you need to evaluate. You know, Three, five years later, you need to sit down and go, these are the problems we identified and we changed the ordinance. Uh, are these problems still a problem? Did our provisions uh, change how that was being driven? If not, what other changes can we make? If so, great. Like, you know, we're good. We can, we can move on. Um, so I am going to give everyone like a one to two minute break really quickly before we jump into the public tree management. I am going to go um, get a cup of coffee myself. I encourage you to do the same, stretch a little bit, and then we'll jump into more of the, uh, the entire community forest management. So um, it is currently 10.09 by my watch, and I will uh, start again at about 10.11.
All right. Uh, I have my coffee. So at the very least, I won't put myself to sleep. Um, and uh, I, I see that there's one or two questions that have rolled in so far. I encourage you as you think about them to slap the questions in the Q&A or the chat. That'll help Ashley manage the questions um, at the end of this. And I do think we're going to have ample time for Q&A. Uh, so again, I encourage you to slap some questions in the chat, put them in the Q&A, and, and we'll get to it at the end. Um, but moving forward now, I, I promised we would talk a little bit about some of the tool. We, so I covered some of the common tools for management of a, um, of a tree resource under your control. So that could be city trees, that could be institution trees, or you could be a, uh, like a campus manager for a corporation. So those are tools that you can use to manage trees under your control. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about tools you can use to assess and help you think about the management of trees in an entire community. So this is gonna cover tools that help with the assessment and maybe the management of trees on both public and private property. And again, this is important because in a given community, um, you know, particularly a municipality, there's lots more trees you don't control than trees you do. And yet we're asking those trees to help with human health, to help with climate change, to help manage stormwater. And so you need to understand how those, you know, how your community is doing on the whole around urban forestry, and then use what influence you have to help accomplish your goals. Cool? All right. So the first one is an urban tree canopy assessment. And an urban tree canopy assessment uses satellite data to categorize land cover. Uh, most commonly in urban forestry, it does a five class classification. It will uh, basically tell you where there are trees, where there's impervious surfaces like buildings and streets, where there's grass or low-lying vegetation, so that most often is lawns in urbanized areas, where there's bare soil, and where there's open water. What it does is it takes regularly collected satellite imagery, it gets fed into a um, geographic information system software platform, and then the computer identifies based on the light signatures given off in the satellite imagery, what those different types of land cover are. You know, trees give off a different light signature than pavement and grass and so on. Um, it's not, the computer's not always right. So a technician usually has to go and, you know, make things a little bit better and teach the computer to get better and the computer gets better. And then eventually you end up with a pretty accurate map. Uh, communities that do this um, usually do it one time and then maybe again, five, 10 years later, this isn't something that is like constantly being updated. But again, you take satellite imagery, you take an area of interest and you feed it into a computer software and you're left with a cool map. These, these maps are helpful because you can see like, where are your community trees and where are they not? You know, where is there a lot of pavement and where is there not? This is important because where you have more pavement and less vegetation, you have more stormwater management problems. Um, it's also important to understand where your tree canopy is because you know, in a lot of communities that's on the outskirts on undeveloped parcels. And if you're experiencing development pressure, you might be losing that tree canopy at some point in the future. And these are all sort of important considerations that come out in doing an urban tree canopy assessment. Uh, urban tree canopy assessments also allow you to estimate the ecosystem benefits of the entire community forest. When we talked about the tree inventory and management plan, we were only estimating the ecosystem benefits provided by the trees that we assessed, the trees along streets, the trees uh, within a park. In this case, you know, we can actually assess the ecosystem benefits provided by all of the community's trees, all those dark green spots. Some of them are public trees, some of them are private trees. And again, a tree doesn't care if it's in a backyard or along the street, it's gonna provide a public benefit. So this is what that, that looks like. And, and this map and these information are from Standish, Michigan, which is a project I worked on a number of years ago now with uh, Relief Michigan. Um, so good information. I, I like this because uh, having these type of data about your community forest gives you true numbers that help justify why trees are important. You, you're not, no longer talking about, well, they're pretty, Well, we just need trees. No, trees have immense value to our community and those provide monetary benefits. I'm going to do an aside right now to tell you where these numbers come from. 
So um, these numbers are developed through a software suite called iTree, which we'll talk about. But the way it's determined is if that tree did not exist, what type of alternative technology is available to provide the same benefit? So if that tree did not exist, how much more stormwater infrastructure would I need to manage the same amount of water that tree does? And how much does that stormwater infrastructure cost to build and maintain on average in a year? So for a gallon of stormwater a tree provides, how much would it cost for me to build the same alternative infrastructure to manage a gallon of stormwater? And they can then say, okay, if this tree did not exist, theoretically, we'd have to build additional infrastructure and that's how much it would cost. So this is true of like the air quality. If that tree did not exist, what air scrubber technologies are available to offer the same benefit? And this, these are how the dollar values come about. Once you have an urban tree canopy assessment done, you can actually look at data and information um, and split it out in many different ways to, to think about your community and, and what, um, how trees are distributed in your community, what inequities might exist in your community. This is actually a look at um, tree, percent, tree canopy by census block. Um, Standish is fairly small, very, fairly homogenous in, in terms of uh, demographics, um, but in large cities and even a lot of small cities, uh, you have people living in different areas, and in some areas you might have more people of low income uh, living, and in other areas you might have more um, communities of color living, and where your tree canopy is and where it isn't starts becoming a little bit of an environmental justice issue. And so understanding how your tree canopy is distributed across your community and what impacts that might have on people and human health and why is a really important finding that can come from these urban tree canopy assessments. So at a minimum, an urban tree canopy assessment should have five cover classes and it should be accurate. Um, you can do seven class uh, canopy assessments. So rather than just having impervious services, you could have um, imperv like roads and streets and then other. Um, you could add tree canopy over impervious services and then just tree canopy. It's totally possible to do a lot of different variations around the classes. The more classes you do, the more expensive or difficult this becomes. Um, so five tends to be the common. Another term that comes up is like uh, user accuracy. And often it's uh, a specified 94, 95, 96% user accuracy. And what that means is that once the canopy assessment is done, the technician who did the assessment goes back and looks at random points to determine did the computer classify it appropriately. And you're trying to achieve an accuracy of 94% or higher or 96% or higher um, to ensure that you have an accurate assessment. At the, at the basic level, I mean, you could do a canopy study that's just percent tree canopy and um, no, like just, you could only classify tree canopy and not tree canopy, that's possible too. But once you're done, you wanna know what the percent tree canopy is across your entire community at the very least, and what the acre of tree canopy is and then any other land cover. There's many different ways you could um, manipulate the data otherwise, but we could, we could talk an entire session about urban tree canopy assessments. And then it's also good, if you're going to do this, to get the ecosystem benefit estimates, at a minimum, the air quality, energy, and carbon sequestration benefits. You can also get property value and water quality and some of these other things, but um, those require a little bit more work, and so I'm, I'm not throwing them into the minimum class. Uh, there's other things you can do with the tree canopy assessment, and I'm just going to show some of those because I think these are really cool and maybe underutilized in the ways that they can uh, show us how our community looks. And this is a uh, heat index map. So if you if you think about urbanized areas, pavement, um, you know, the sun makes the pavement, the pavement gives off heat. There tends to be higher temperatures where there's more pavement and lower temperatures where there's more trees. And so here's here's a map that just helps look at, you know, where is a relatively higher temperature gradients in a community and, and what might that mean for degradation of infrastructure, um, human comfort in a business district, for example, or uh, you know what, what might impact energy use and air conditioners and so on. There's a lot of information that can be gleaned from maps like this. A really cool thing you can do is also develop a prioritized planting uh, plan. And um, this is again for public and private property. And it's not saying that we're going to plant trees in all these places or you should plant trees in all these places. But what this map actually shows us is where can trees be planted that they will have the greatest impact on stormwater. 
the way this is developed is it's essentially a negative of the tree canopy map. You take that tree canopy map, you throw out the pavement, you're not going to plant trees in a building. You throw out the existing trees, you're not going to plant trees on top of a tree. You throw out the water, you're not going to plant trees in the middle of a lake, hopefully. Um, but you may plant trees where there's grass and you may plant trees where there's uh, uh, bare soil. You can then take out the sports fields and airports and things like that where you're just not going to be allowed to plant trees and you're left with all the possible places you could plant trees in a community. Based on that, you can bring in all sorts of data and information. And in this case, we were interested in stormwater. So it was more like slope, proximity to pavement, proximity to water bodies, what soil factors we can use, and so on and so forth to then identify those locations in the community where trees can be planted, that they would have the greatest chance of intercepting more stormwater. But you could do this with human health. You could pull in human health data. You could do this with a heat island uh, map that I just showed you and, and target that. There's many different ways you could prioritize planting. And it's a, a cool way to do it. So I wanna move now uh, away from urban tree canopy assessments. Uh, I, I like them a lot. I think they're very useful. Um, they're a great way to sort of prioritize things throughout an entire community, get a good handle on, on where things are. We didn't even talk about like ordinances and policies. You can use tree canopy assessments to understand like where you're losing trees and why. Um, but that's, that's a whole nother discussion could be had on that topic. So we're going we're gonna to walk away from that and go to uh, iTree. So I, I do have a lot of conversations with people about iTree. And iTree is a, uh, a suite of software tools that help you estimate ecosystem benefits of trees or give you information about community trees. Um, people often will say, we're using iTree or I want to use iTree and I always wanna know what tool because iTree is not a single tool, it's many tools. And more importantly, iTree is actually a, a system of calculation. So underlying all of these tools is the same model, the same system of calculation that has been developed by people much smarter than me at universities who have done a lot of research to understand the benefits that trees provide and how valuable those benefits are, and then developed equations to predict those values and benefits. And iTree uses those equations and those models, or iTree is those equations and models. And then the tools give us ways to easily access those equations and models. So the ones I'm gonna talk about today, because they relate fundamentally to the urban forest as a whole are iTree Canopy, iTree Eco, and iTree Landscape. But again, we could give a whole day's seminar on all of the different iTree tools. So this is a screenshot of iTree Landscape. iTree Landscape has a lot of land cover data, much like an urban tree canopy assessment, but not at that same resolution, already in the system. So you can go to iTree Landscape and you can select a community. And then you can, um, you know, use different geographies in here. You know, there's, there's, they've got census blocks in here. They've got the designated places, which is like municipal boundaries. You can use any of those geographies to begin to explore tree canopy in a community or in an area of interest, maybe a whole county. Um, the land cover includes more than just tree canopy. There's also impervious surfaces and uh, other things in there. And it will also estimate some of the tree benefits, which is the screen I have right now. Um, so using the national land cover data set from 2011, I'm pretty sure this is a map from Mason, Michigan is what I was playing with the other day. Um, yep, Mason. Um, you can see how much carbon storage, what the value is per year of that, um, carbon sequestration equivalent. And so we're looking at the carbon benefits here. The land cover maps that they have are either from 2011 or 2001. So it is a little bit dated. And again, it's not at the same resolution as a canopy study, but this is something that you could sit down at your computer and do tomorrow without paying a dime. Uh, all it's gonna take is your time. So this is a neat tool. It's got a lot of options in it. It can be a little bit um, sometimes tricky to navigate, but if you play around with it, you can usually figure it out. Um, and it's a great way to just kind of get a, a surface level estimate of what your tree canopy percentage was at least in 2011 and 2001 and start to look at some of the information. And it'll even let you do some initial tree planting. What it won't do is give you a map like this. Rather, you're gonna be forced to like choose census blocks and it's gonna tell you in a map like this, which census blocks you should prioritize planting trees. The next one is iTree Canopy. iTree Canopy was, a, was before iTree Landscape and it's a lot easier to use, but it doesn't have nearly the same amount of information. But 
you can use iTree Canopy to estimate the total tree canopy, the total percentage of tree canopy. The way iTree Canopy works is you log into the system, you tell them what city or county or whatever you're interested in, and then it asks you um, how many land cover classes you want to create. Most of the time, I usually do tree and no tree, but you could do like the tree, the other vegetation, bare soil, impervious surface, and water if you wanted to. The trick is in the next step. Once you're done setting it up, you've got your community of interest and you have um, your, uh, your classes set up, it's going to put a dot on the map and you can see right in the center there, there's a little like yellow crosshatch. And you're going to have to tell the system what that is. So if you put in like five cover classes or 10 cover classes, you're going to have to like hit the drop box over on the right here and scroll down to the right one. And your job just got a little bit difficult. So if you're truly only interested in what the percent canopy is, you should only do tree and no tree. But the dot shows up, you tell it what cover it is, tree or not a tree is usually what I do. And then you hit next, save and create new. Another dot appears somewhere else on the map and it'll scroll in for you and tell, you tell it what it is there. And you do this in somewhere like between 200 and 300 points. You can get a statistically accurate estimate of the total tree canopy, the percent tree canopy in an area of interest and the ecosystem benefits that that tree canopy is um, estimated to produce. So it's a quick and dirty way to get information about total canopy level and ecosystem benefits. Uh, I always tell people like, this is again, a free and easy tool to use. Um, it essentially costs a beer and a good TV program. This is one of those things I can do sitting in a chair at, you know, at six at night, you know, relaxing at the end of the day. So it's, it's pretty easy to use. It's easier to use than landscape, but again, it doesn't provide the level of information that landscape does, and certainly not the same level of information that you would get in a full urban tree canopy assessment. The last tool, and the one that um, I think is probably most commonly, um, when people say I'm using iTree or I wanna use iTree, this is the one they usually are thinking of. It used to be called iTree Streets, and before that, iTree Stratum. It is now iTree Eco. Everything is rolled into iTree Eco. And iTree Eco needs information about trees. So you, you literally have to have um, like a, a street tree inventory that you can import into iTree Eco, or a sample inventory that you can import into iTree Eco, or iTree Eco does have a protocol for um, doing like a plot sample across an entire area of interest. And so usually what that is, is it requires 200 plots. Um, there, I think, I might get this wrong, a 40th of an acre plot. And you measure all the trees in there and collect information about them. And then you import those data into iTree Eco. And iTree Eco then gives very robust reports about species distribution and um, pest and disease susceptibility, uh, depending on the data you collected, it might help you understand maintenance and prioritization and condition of trees and what the percent trees are, percent shrubs. It depends on if you did those plot, it's limited by what data you collected and imported in the system. But if you have really robust data sets and import in the system, you'll get really robust analytics. If you have very simple data sets, you'll get very simple analytics. But iTree Eco is now where iTree Streets um, went and it can be used either with sample inventories, it can be used with full inventories, or you can go out and do randomized plots. Uh, and again, this is a free tool. It's a very robust tool, and it's going to give you ecosystem benefits based on the data that you entered. And it will also um, give you some various, like this is a, a summary of trees in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is one of the example data sets in the system. So you can get all sorts of cool information uh, and, and analytics in iTree Eco. This is complicated to use, but there are robust guides available. So briefly, I just wanted to say iTree is a collection of tools and utilities based on scientifically rigorous models that you can use to analyze your community forest and estimate ecosystem benefits. It's a way that you can assess data and information. Um, it's an estimating model for ecosystem benefits. So it's not gonna tell you that this tree, this 24 inch sugar maple always um, sequesters a thousand pounds of carbon every year. It's going to tell you that like, based on this tree's size in comparison of similar trees, this tree provides roughly a thousand pounds of carbon sequestration each year. Every tree is different. There's no way to like predict exactly what a tree does without complex measurements. So this is a predictatory model. It's estimating an average based on the data that we have and the understanding that we have. 
it's helpful to make comparisons between a neighborhood and a neighborhood, your community and another community. Um, and it's a good system. So iTree needs data in certain ways. And so it's a good thing to look at, to think about how you're gonna collect data and what your data collection protocols might be. iTree is not a single tool or utility. It's a ton of tools. It's models that many tools help us uh, access. It's not a data collection tool. iTree Eco does have some data collection um, functions, but it's pretty limited. And it, if you use it, you may be limited in how you can use your data in other ways on the back end. So it's not a good way to collect basic information or data. So it's better to collect your data and then import it into iTree than use iTree as the data collection tool. It's also not a good way to like manage and edit your data long-term. You shouldn't be storing your data in iTree and using your data via iTree. You should use it only to analyze your data. And it's also, as I said, not absolute. It's not telling you exactly what this tree or population of trees is doing. It's estimating what that population of trees is likely to be doing as a result of the science that we have. So um, I, I wanna switch and go and talk a little bit about an urban forest master plan. We talked about management plans earlier, which focus on the, the, the public tree resource or the tree resource under your control. And now we're gonna talk about a master plan. And a master plan is a document that helps establish a community vision for urban forestry, um, community accepted goals for that vision or resource, and then lays out a, a plan that can help coalesce multiple partners with multiple jurisdictions and multiple impacts on the urban forest towards that community vision. So a master plan usually starts with um, an analysis of the resource. What is the entire community forest look like right now? What condition is it in? What is the extent of our community trees? What's our tree canopy percent? Any data that you have, and you, you may have limited data, you may have a lot of data, but any data that you have goes into like, what do we have right now? What, do our, what does our urban forest look like right now? And then you use that information to have a conversation of like, what do we want it to be? Like, do we want more trees? Do we want to address tree risk? Do we want more trees on private property? Like, what do we want from our community forest? Like, what do we want to address? And then you, you establish a plan, much like a management plan, of what specific actions can we and our partners take to move us closer to our goal? How can we take the resource that we have get all of our partners doing the different things our partners do in a better way to help us accomplish a goal. And then probably the most ignored part of these planning efforts is you need some sort of mechanism to go back and ask, how are we doing? Um, to assess things on a regular interval to understand, like, are we making an impact? Are we really moving this needle forward? And this is one of those things that goes back to that map I showed earlier, where despite a lot of our efforts, a lot of communities are still losing tree canopy. And part of that might be that they established a plan and, or maybe they don't even have a plan, but maybe they did have a plan and they haven't been assessing it to even figure out if the stuff they're doing is making an impact. And so you don't even have a chance to go, oh, wait, that's not working. What else could we do? What differently do we need to do to help us accomplish our goals? So, um, you know, manage master plans can be really complex. Um, you know, this is just a screenshot from one that's like a couple hundred pages. Uh, a lot of that's appendices, but you know, it, it thoroughly analyzes the resource, where there's trees, where there's not trees, um, you know, urban heat island, what climate change susceptibility might be, insect disease susceptibility, um, what's the, uh, you know, the um, total uh, resource, you know, and then created some goals. And you have the goals at the top, you know, basically to protect and increase tree canopy, to manage the urban forest. And this is from Miami Beach, by the way. Um, and then connect and engage to so bring more people into the fold, to help people understand why trees are important to get involved in the management of trees. And then there's targets. Um, so that they're going to achieve a 22% tree canopy, uh, implement a five-year maintenance plan, and then um, you know, release an annual report. And then there's all sorts of recommendations or action steps that need to take place to help make those things happen. So this is what a master plan does. It sets a vision, it creates some goals, and then it lays out ways that all of the different partners can work together to move that vision, those goals forward. But here's a more simple one right here from Michigan. This is Macomb County, Michigan, and they have an urban forestry roadmap. And rather than some big giant document that's 30, 40, 150 pages long, this is a big Excel spreadsheet. And what it has is just a series of goals the issue that that goal is uh, attempting to resolve and then clearly identifies different strategies 
that can take place to move that goal forward, the prioritization, how they're going to measure it, and then resources and examples. So this is like a, um, a strategic plan or a strategic roadmap in an Excel spreadsheet. And this is, uh, this is this way, partly because it's a little bit more useful than trying to flip through a giant plan all the time. Um, you know, it's something you could frame and put on a wall and look at all the time. And also because, you know, uh, writing or either writing yourself takes time, which is expensive, or hiring a consultant to write takes time, which is expensive. So sometimes if you really just have a few more simple goals and maybe you don't have a lot of complex issues you need to sort through, the, uh, a little bit more of a roadmap or a, a simplified strategic plan might be appropriate. I will add for either of these, um, robust stakeholder engagement is extremely important. You need to make sure that all the people, all the partners that are going to be involved in the management of trees are informed, engaged, and provide input throughout the entire process. Otherwise, you're not going to have any buy-in on the back end. So at a minimum, your, um, your master planning process should describe your objectives, set your goals, create the vision, have an analysis of sort of your current conditions based on the data that you have, analyze what resources you have available to help you manage your trees, and then set clear priorities so that all the partners know what's important and can work towards that vision. To, the, uh, you know, to my point about stakeholder engagement, on the right-hand side here is a list of the steering committee members for Pittsburgh's master plan. This isn't even everyone they engaged. This is just the people that had a seat at the decision-making table to make decisions around the plan, what's in the plan, what the goals are. And you'll notice that several of these are public agencies but a number of these are also nonprofits. A number of these are community organizations. And that's really important because all of these people, all of these groups have significant impacts on the trees in Pittsburgh and have a, a role to play in the management of them. And therefore, they're all given an equal decision-making power in what is in this plan and what the community vision is. And this is really what the power is of a master planning process. It's a way to develop buy-in and understanding for community trees so that you as a tree manager are not alone, particularly in trying to influence what happens on the land you don't control. So there is one tool available to allow municipalities to um, exercise control uh, or you know, guidance on lands that they don't directly manage, and that's tree protection ordinance. We talked about a tree ordinance earlier, which I described as a document that specifically is for the, um, the trees under direct control management of an institution or an agency. Uh, tree protection ordinance then might provide guidance or requirements for how trees might be deal dealt with on properties outside of their direct control or management. Sometimes these are in the same document. A lot of times they're separate. Tree protection ordinances often live within a zoning ordinance in a community. Um, so most common ordinances I've seen basically uh, in Michigan at least, will say all trees over six inches in diameter um, need to be on a landscape plan. And then if you're going to remove them, you might be required to replant a certain number of trees. I'm, I'm getting down to the gist and, and boiling it down to the basic of what a lot of these are. Some of them, you know, maybe protect contiguous woodlands, but not trees in isolation. Um, other ones might, uh, you know, not might be at eight inches or 18 inches or three inches. Some of them might only require this type of provision on uh, any property that's not single family or multifamily residential. So it's mostly commercial and properties and development. Um, some of them may require it on every tree, regardless of development. So there's many different variations on these tree protection ordinances, but they're all designed to try to either preserve and retain trees that are important to uh, the fabric of the community and the benefits in the community, or uh, at the very least, force consideration of those trees in the design and development process. Um, Grand Rapids is one that's one of the most unique in Michigan, and this one actually sets a minimum tree canopy level based on their urban tree canopy assessment, uh, and then has canopy goals established for each property classification that um, either you need to achieve by retaining trees or you need to achieve by planting for and maintaining the trees uh, to, to achieve that tree canopy. It's, it's one way of looking at it. And I, I'm just showing this again, because the, the big thing here is it all depends on what goals you're trying to achieve. Um, are you trying to achieve a canopy level or are you trying to retain trees? Like what is, 
too many of these ordinances again are written like we need to save all the trees and then you know someone goes looks up a couple examples oh this is a good ordinance let's adopt it and they don't really sit down and wonder like what factors in our community are actually driving pressure to remove trees or pressure to develop and what can we really do what policy tools do we have available to us to try to move the needle and and that's a really important consideration it often requires um, some conversation with community stakeholders not just internal to the city but with developers uh, with business groups with other groups to really understand what they think about the problem and how you can influence them uh, and, and provide the right incentives or disincentives to accomplish your goals so just like tree ordinances you need a good process and again you need to think about your problem you need to look at what authority you have what can you do what you can't do what's purpose and intent um, research the factors that drive the problem. And this involves talking to people affected by the problem who are impacting the problem, you know, come up with your goals and then really sit down and, and write the right kind of provisions that are best designed to meet your goals within the limits of authority that you might have. At a minimum, you need clear goals for this entire process. The, the responsibility of who's gonna manage this and enforce it or who's gonna be the, the ones that permits go to need to be designated you need basic performance standards. And so this means like um, if you're protecting trees, what does it mean to protect a tree? Uh, is it just leaving that stick in the ground and excavating all about it, all around it? Or do you have, you know, um, root zone protection standards? And what does that look like? What does that mean? You're always going to need flexibility. Uh, if you don't have flexibility, you're just going to run into legal dispute after legal dispute. There's, there's properties out there that someone bought with the intention of developing, and now you're changing the rules on them. And you know that's not necessarily fair. So you need to allow some sort of relief valve to accommodate for those types of changes and make sure that you're still accomplishing your goal, but the other parties get their goals accomplished as well. Um, enforcement needs to be considered and specified. Uh, you know, who's going to be doing the enforcement? What does that look like? What are the fees or penalties? Um, and I would say that it's really tough to develop a tree protection ordinance that's meaningful and effective if it's not done under some overarching management strategy. So what is the overarching community goals? Like, what are you really trying to accomplish in urban forestry in your community? And how does the ordinance fit in? And then the ordinance needs to be developed with that in mind. And lastly, it's critical tree protection ordinances in particular are developed with community support. Early, regular engagement and conversations will set you up for success as opposed to failure. You may not be able to do everything that you would have done in a vacuum, but at least you'll have a better chance of getting it passed and a better chance of staying out of the courtroom. So uh, that's the tools that I wanted to talk about today. I mean, many of these I could give entire presentations on and we could have robust conversations about them. So if, if there's uh, any of these that you really want to learn more about, like, I think I'm, I'm curious, um, you can certainly slap that in the chat and say, hey, I'd love to learn more about whatever. And Ashley and I will keep track of that for any opportunities either of us have for future presentations. Um, otherwise, this is the time of the day where you guys get to ask me questions and I stare awkward, awkwardly at the screen until someone asks a question. So I'm going to turn my video back on. Lee, do you see the one in the Q&A? Do you want me to read it? Um, I can pull it up. Okay. So referencing back to the Nova, this is from Michael. Referencing back to the Novi map, how do you typically determine the level of tree maintenance prioritization? So um, the best way of doing that is through, so in, in the industry of arboriculture, uh, there are two groups that dictate a lot of what we do. One is the International Society of Boriculture, which establishes a lot of best practices, does training, outreach, and education. And the other is um, the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, which creates standards for all sorts of things from bolts to cars to um, the practice of boriculture. So the A300 committee is the committee that uh, exercises um, the, the creation and maintenance of standards around boriculture. So those two groups have developed what's called the tree risk assessment methodology. And it's a series of um, basically questions you ask yourself about each tree. And the first one of those is, uh, you know, it, what is the likelihood of failure for a particular tree or a part of a tree within a given timeline? Usually a year, but it could be two years, could be three. It should be based on your inspection interval. So if you have an inspection interval of three years, you need to think about that in terms of three years. Um, and then if that tree or part were to fail, what's the likelihood of it hitting a target of interest? And so that could be people along the street. It could be 
um, cars, it could be a building. Now, the likelihood of it hitting something is not just if there is something present that could be a target, but also how frequently that thing is actually there. So I argue along neighborhood streets, you know, the, the likelihood of impact is actually relatively low um, for people. There's not often people around in neighborhood streets. There are often cars, um, but that's usually more at the uh, in the evening. This year is different. But along a major thoroughfare, however, or in a business district, there's much more frequently people and cars and you know if a tree fell and blocked an emergency route then you're talking about uh you know emergency access so there's a lot of things there and then lastly if that tree or part were to fail if it were to hit a target how much damage would it cause so all of, you work through those questions and you're left with the risk levels i mentioned earlier of extreme high moderate or low and again this whole process is it is its own class but the point i i want to make in this is that when you create your risk management strategy and you say that these are major thoroughfares and business districts, you skipped that middle question. You just said, these are the areas where there's high occupancy, there's a high likelihood if, if something fails, it's gonna hit something, okay? So you've answered that question. Um, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna think a little bit about what types of failures are gonna cause the most damage. And so this is like large whole tree failure. This is like limbs, six inches and greater. And so then when you do your inspection, your drive-by of those thoroughfares that you identified as being the highest risk areas, you're looking, you're driving through, you have your flashers on maybe, maybe you have someone in the next seat so you can concentrate on driving and they're the one inspecting. And you look around and you drive down the street and you're looking for only those whole trees that are dead, diseased, dying, decayed, and are likely to fail within you know, whatever your inspection time frame is, um, and or limbs six inches or greater, they're dead, diseased, dying, broken, damaged, or otherwise, uh, you know, failing. Um, and so that's your threshold, right? You're, you're looking now for only those situations because you're on the high occupancy areas. You're looking only for those situations where you're likely to achieve a high risk level and those issues need to be managed. Now, all of that is guided by your risk management strategy and your frequency of inspections and understanding and where you have have eye occupancy and so on. But again, I, I'd be happy to talk one on one a whole lot more about risk management and what that looks like and how that might go into your risk management policy, because your policy needs to be developed with an understanding of not only the resource, but um, what resources you have. I got another one from uh, B. Gerard, um, you know, that, you know, we are, uh, Obviously, Davies in the business of offering the service, but do we offer training? Yeah, we do training all the time. Um, we offer classes uh, you know, we can do customized training for communities. We have a number of communities that have brought us in to, to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about what some of your, your basic training needs might be and whether uh, you know, us and there's several of us in Michigan uh, who have experience in various aspects of urban forestry, whether we could provide the training you need or if there's other resources out there that, that you can get as well. Um, Lee uh, is asking, I volunteer for a tree advocacy group in Tecumseh, uh, Tecumseh, Tecumseh, I always get that one wrong. Our community doesn't yet have a tree survey. What would be our first steps to create one? Pros and cons of do-it-yourself versus hiring an expert. Are grants available for later? Okay, so um, anyone can do a tree survey. You know, you, you can go out there tomorrow with a pen and paper and collect an address and a tree species, but the accuracy of the data and the robustness of the data are gonna be limited by the experience and level of training of the person doing the assessment. So whether or not you can do it or have volunteers do it, or you want to hire an expert, it's going to be a function of what robustness you want from the data. So I actually did a research study that's out there um, and I, I wish I had it on hand, I'd paste it in here, where we had volunteers go out and collect tree inventory data and volunteers of different experience level and then uh, professionals went out and collected tree inventory data. And we did this in like five different cities uh, across, the, the, uh, across the world. And what we found is that like uh, volunteers, even pretty well-trained and experienced volunteers are really good at understanding where the tree is, uh, the condition and whether the tree is alive, um, the species, genus, uh, diameter of the tree. But it really starts breaking down when you start talking about like um, priority, risk, maintenance, um, you know, funny species that might be out there trying to drill down on some of that. So it, it really depends on what level of information you want. And are grants available? Yes, the state of Michigan has grants every year through the Michigan Urban and Community Forestry Grant Program. They're generally made available at the end of July or early August. 
And in the past, you've been able to get up to $20,000 to help fund a tree inventory. For every dollar you ask for, you have to provide $1 a match. Um, so that's, that's out there. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll get notification from Relief Michigan. And if you're in my, um, if you're in my, uh, my mailing list, you'll get one from me as well when those grants are available. Um, I'm gonna stop there on that question. I'm looking at the chat just to see if there's anything there. Yeah, I don't see anything unless anything is going directly to you, which is possible. Uh, that's it. Um, I'm trying to think here for a moment uh, if there's anything else I want to babble on about for a little bit. Well, you are thinking I'm going to get the link for the survey for mm, yeah. credits, and I will put that in the chat for you all. Give me just a minute. And, and again, I think, you know, this is just a survey of different tools. Um, there are some other tools out there to help manage urban forest, help understand urban forest. Uh, I just talked about the most common ones. But, you know, I, I do have my contact information um, up on the screen. I'm based in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but I, uh, under normal circumstances, travel all over the, uh, the Midwest. Um, and so I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you, uh, you know, calling call me, email me is definitely free. Uh, so if you have questions about these things, want to know other things or, or want to dive deeper in any of the tools we talked about, like I certainly encourage you to reach out. I'm just going to stare awkwardly at the screen until uh, either our time's up or uh, someone asks any more questions. My coffee is cold. That means it was a long meeting. So I don't blame anyone just walking out at this point. That was great. We certainly appreciate your time. Yeah, I always I always enjoy supporting Relief Michigan, and uh, you know certainly these network meetings have always been helpful to attend when we can do them in person, and I look forward to when we can do that again. Um, and I, I get a lot out of presenting to this group. I started pea soup this morning in the crock pot and now it's really starting to, uh, and it's kind of like, I, I, I'm a little bit afraid that I need to check on it, but we got a couple minutes. Well, it's about the season to, uh, to really ramp up urban forestry maintenance. Um, I always tended to think about the winter as a planning season to tackle some of these tools and think about grants, but I hope uh, I hope everyone's going to have a, a safe, successful um, planting season, and then you know really really dive into uh, everything else that happens. Let's see, there's a hand raise. Did you uh, ask about that one? I sent him a message. Didn't get a response. Okay. I see a comment from. Jeremy, about learning more about iTree, perhaps a longer presentation over just that would be good. That will be, that's a great idea. And that'll be something we can look into. And there's, um, so iTree is implemented by the Davy Institute. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a separate organization from me, but still part of the Davy family. And there is a, uh, a institute representative based in Chicago that specifically um, his job is like technical transfer and helping people understand how to use the iTree tools. His name's Al Zelaya, so he would be a great presenter. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually in the iTree Academy right now um, and he is an instructor. So. Perfect, yeah. I'll reach out and see about doing something like that. It's, it's great. They have a lot of um, tools like you said for um, getting kind of estimates at least to get started with. And 
all of those other tools uh, have their applications. Um, and, and I only really talked about the most commonly used ones for, you know, particularly people who aren't maybe diving deep into the iTree world. And, and hopefully those are useful, but I mean, some of them are extremely robust. Like iTree Eco has, we, we only scratch the surface and iTree Hydro in particular is a model that a scientist used to understand um, stream hydrology and land cover changes. And, you know, I, I sometimes feel like you need a PhD to use that one, but they are very uh, robust. Uh, okay, Marvin's asking about repeat or review the decision-making process for assigning the priority planting levels as mapped. So, yeah, um, the one that I demonstrated was for uh, planting trees to prioritize stormwater capture. And so basically you start with a map of everywhere that trees could possibly be planted. So that means you've taken out the, the sports fields, the golf courses, the airports, uh, the pavement, the buildings, other trees, water. And so you're left with everywhere a tree could potentially go. Then you bring in other data layers. So under most circumstances for like the stormwater, those data layers include how close is a planting location to pavement or how close is it to bodies of water? What is the slope? Or um, you know, what is the topography in different areas? Because water is more likely gonna run away real quickly where there's more slope or there's not. Uh, there's various soils data that you can pull into there, like how permeable is the soil? How regularly can the soil absorb water? And you can put all of that into the mapping system. And then the mapping system is gonna determine um, you know, in those locations where there's maybe more slope, less permeable, uh, less permeable um, soil and nearest to impervious surface, that would be a high priority location to plant a tree. Where you're near other trees and you have like really sandy soils and it's very flat, uh, that's probably a lower priority place to put a tree. Um, so the, the system, it's all based on what data layers you put in and how you want to tell the system how those data impact water runoff. And, and I'm being a little bit nuanced here because you can do that with anything. We have a tendency to do it most often with stormwater, but if you have data that can help you categorize how to do, um, you know, like the urban heat island, you could do a very similar process. But again, you just pull in data about the land that might impact how stormwater happens and you put it into the system and then you can start, the system will start telling you where trees can be planted. Uh, Lee earlier mentioned that Davy offers programs for communities. I couldn't quickly find much about that on the website. Can you give me a quick overview, including ballpark pricing, um, public education programs? So, um, I mean, so if we're thinking about us doing presentations or training programs, uh, it, it's going to vary quite a bit depending on the topic and who the person is that we would need to put to do that training. Like, is it me? Is it Carrie Gray, who was the city forester for Ann Arbor for a number of years? Is it Emily Hansen on our team, who was a senior forester in New York City for a number of years? Like, who is the best person on our team to deliver the training? And then the other question is, do we have materials already for that training? Or is it a custom training that we might have to develop? Because the way we price most things in our business is based on time. It's not like a product that has a, a price. It's, um, you know, what are hourly rates? So uh, our hourly rates on our team are going to range for the people that would do training range from like $75 an hour to $115 an hour. Um, and then, you know, a, uh, if we have pre-existing training materials, we've just got to account for the time in the class, maybe a little bit of preparation and whatever travel there might be. Um, and then if it's something that we don't really have many materials, I usually figure there's two to three hours out of the class for prep for each hour in the class. So like if you're asking us to do a one hour training um, that is totally unique and custom, then that's probably like four or five hours of work plus travel. And so, you know, it might be anywhere from six to eight hours at either the, the uh, and maybe some expenses, but at the um, 75 or 115. So you can kind of do the math there, right? If it's something we've done before and know how to do, uh, and you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward and we can use someone at $75 an hour, um, who has the experience to deliver what you need, then, you know, it might be two, two, three hours at 75 an hour. So, 
I wish I had a straight, more straightforward answer for you, but you know, that's, that's how we tend to do the math and work. So if you have specific ideas, um, you know, I'd love to have that conversation because we're also not the only one that provides training, you know, Relief Michigan provides training and public outreach. Um, the International Society of Boriculture Michigan chapter has conferences and education workshops that are already being put on that, uh, you know, may be beneficial to you and the state of Michigan sometimes does some training. So, you know, you may not need to pay me. Um, and, and that's fine too, you know, I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. Um, I don't see any other questions.